Dana. Thank you. Good. Hang it in there. Hey everyone, welcome to the State Department. I can see there's a packed crowd today. I think of uh, outgoing PAOs and IOs, is that right? Anyway, welcome. Um, and happy Wednesday. Uh, just one thing to read at the top and then I'll take your questions. Uh, as you, uh, many of you know, uh, Secretary of State uh, Kerry's met today uh, with the foreign ministers of the five states of Central Asia for the second C5 plus one ministerial and that was upstairs in the Benjamin Franklin room. Uh, you all saw we put out a media note as well as a joint statement. Uh, and um, obviously the group discussed uh, issues of economic connectivity, uh, regional security, the environment, and climate change, as well as humanitarian issues. And they also agreed to launch five joint projects that were developed by the C5 plus one working groups that met after the first ministerial in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, which was last November 2015. The United States is excited uh, to be continuing the C5 plus one format as we broaden and deepen our uh, relationship with the Central Asian states. Over to you, Matt. Okay. <clears throat> There's a lot to go through. Um, let me start with Iran, and I know that this was raised ad nauseum at length uh, during the White House briefing, but so I'll try and make mine extremely short. Okay. Um, as has been pointed out um, over and over and over again by your colleague over there, the agreement on the Hague uh, claim uh, was settled and announced by you all publicly in January. Do you know Correct. why at that time you guys were not prepared to say that the $400 million that Iran was owed, what why, why you were not prepared to say that, uh, or describe the manner in which that was transferred to the Iranians? Well, I think, uh, and I'm still frankly not prepared to talk about the mechanics of how that transfer question is, was made. Then why? What, well, what is the big secret here? Why, why, well, why is this such an issue? Uh, that's a fair question. I, I think, I mean, first of all, let me tell you what I can say about it. Um, don't just repeat the same. I, I mean, won't. people I don't heard know. this. I didn't see. I didn't, I didn't well, see it went on if for I almost myself, over. Then, went on for, o, it went on for that. over an hour. No, I mean, what I can, what what I would say is, without getting into the nitty gritty details of how uh, that payment was made, what I can say is uh, that uh, Iran uh, was at that time, and frankly, still is to some degree, uh, relatively disconnected from uh, the international financial system. And so that raised certain challenges in uh, getting them their money. Uh, it couldn't be done uh, over wire transfers or any of kind of the legal methods that, uh, or the legal, the financial method rather, that are commonly used to transfer uh, large sums of money. Uh, so bearing in mind that, um, you know, we had to figure out ways to get them the money. Um, we don't have, we've never reestablished a direct banking relationship uh, with Iran and still, frankly, don't intend to do so. So, I mean, those are the limitations under which we were operating. It seems like there may be other ways. To, I mean, I, were other ways considered and discarded? I mean, you could have sent them gold, by like bars or something, I suppose. But, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty heavy. But, and I don't know how I much 400 million in euros and Swiss francs weighs. Uh, but, you know, there's a yeah, Bitcoin. So Couldn't and you have gotten like a, a cashier's check from some European bank and presented that well, to again, them? Well, again, we've seen, again, and I don't want to wade too deeply into this, um, but, you know, we've seen subsequent to the JCPOA implementation day and the lifting of some sanctions, we have seen in a separate uh, channel altogether, but we've seen a reticence by some banks uh, to engage or do business or find financial transactions with Iran uh, due to several reasons. One is, as the President uh, has made clear, that Iran's continued bad behavior does make them reluctant. Let me finish. The other is that, sorry, I thought you were looking at me like you're getting impatient. <laughs> uh, and the other is that, you know, that there are uh, sanctions laws, or sanctions rather, that are still in place um, that financial institutions, international banks still don't have a clear understanding of, and all of that weighs on, again, our ability or anyone's ability to uh, to engage in financial transactions so physically, with Iran. whose cash was it? Was it the governments? I, I'm of not going to get into the details. Did you have that. to give the governments that supplied these bank net, this currency, the, the equivalent? Again, I mean, it I, seems like you could have gotten a great deal post-Brexit if you had paid them in sterling. For, you know. Matt, I, I, 
I'm not you privy have, to those details, and I don't have them. I, I don't know that I could get into that level of detail. Why? I, I just don't get why not. Uh, again, I don't think uh, I don't know how common it is for us to get into the details of these kinds of transactions. Um, well, you see what happens when you don't, and then it comes out how I don't. I mean, the, I guess so. the amount I mean, of the the amount of frankly conspiratizing, conspiratizing, or whatever. Without, with, you know, without you giving a definitive account of it, people are draw their own conclusions. But we did acknowledge that this took place uh, at the time. The president and the secretary both spoke to it. I mean, frankly, other than, you know, some of these salacious details that they're trying to put forth uh, as to the uh, transactions. Salacious. Well, I mean, in terms of. I you thought know, it wasn't salacious. Your no, whole point, the whole point. That's not true. I'm saying that the, the article alleges uh, uh, that well, there's very later. little there's very little news to this. We have been out from the day or the time that the implementation or the JCPOA was signed, an implementation day, and I've talked about all of these, uh, all the elements, the freeing of the detainees, uh, obviously the agreement uh, signing and reaching implementation day, but as well as uh, you know re resolving this. Uh, claim. Do you know why it was this claim? There are more other outstanding claims there are. Uh, that Iran has against the United States. Why was it decided back a year ago, whenever it was that the litigation on this really got heated up in the course of the nuclear talks? Why was this one the one that was chosen to be to sure. be settled? I think my understanding was that they were close to a reaching a settlement, so it was within grasp. I think there was concern, and we've talked about this uh, from legal experts, that if it didn't and it went to the tribunal, for that we would, frankly, it would not be favorable, the tribunal's decision to uh, us. And my last one yeah, on this is just, does the, if a private citizen owed the Iranian government, let's say, a more modest amount of money, say $40,000, still more than 10000 that would require to be transferred, would it be legal for that person, whoever it is, to send cash to the Iranian government? Would it be legal under current U.S. law <clears throat> to, send, to send that cash to Iran? Uh, good question. Um, I'm not sure the answer. I mean, it's not, I mean, obviously th th there's no applicable sanctions that I'm aware of, but I know we're not, uh, we're not doing from well, U.S. financial the institutions, we're not engaged. administration required to get from itself, from Treasury? A special, specific license to do this. Yeah, 100 million I, I'm not aware of that, transfer. but I can I can certainly ask. Right. Yeah, go ahead. One, um, and you use the word salacious. Do you feel that there's something unseemly about having made this transfer to the Iranians in the form of cash? Uh, I mean, I was being a little glib, and I should never do that from the podium. Um, what the point I was trying to make was that. Uh, other than some of the, again, alleged details, because I'm not going to speak to the mechanics beyond what I just said, um, that there really wasn't much new to this article. Uh, um, it made a lot of allegations that this was ransom. It is not. It was not. We said that from the beginning. But again, there's not really anything that all of you weren't aware of at the time that this happened, other than, as I said, some of the, you know, we have not gotten into the details of how that transfer took place. I'm sorry, I, your question was. The question was, is it unseemly that you paid this in cash? I, I, I mean, there were, so there were reasons to do so. Again, operating under the constrictions that we were operating under, which was, you know, that, uh, that uh, at the time that, uh, and to an extent it remains the case, that Iran is frankly, or was disconnected from the uh, global financial system. And so, this is not something new. It's not. Uh, it's uh, again. We've seen this manifested elsewhere as as it tries to get back into the uh, international marketplace. It's having a hard time connecting with banks and other uh, institutions. So, uh, no. I mean, I don't. You know, I think it was. We were. The, the, all options were vetted. Uh, this was considered to be the most uh, efficient way to do it. And again, I'm not trying to confirm the details in that article. I don't want to. Other options. I don't, I don't have them in front of me. About one particular Please. option. I mean, you'll recall that uh, when Treasury um, designated Banco Delta Asia as a uh, um, under the Patriot Act as a as a primary money laundering concern, and then froze a, 
about $25 million in North Korean accounts. Uh, and, and then you guys, the U.S. government ended up giving the money back. And as I recall, that transfer uh, also to a country with very little access to the outside banking world, you, you ended up having the New York Federal Reserve execute that transfer through an obscure third or fourth or fifth tier regional Russian bank. I mean, was there any way of doing it through the Russians or through the Chinese or through somebody else? Uh, in all honesty, Arshad, um, I, I don't, in, in, in answer to Matt's question, I don't have kind of a, a list of the various options that were looked at. I just know that, um, you know, that uh, in the effort to conclude this settlement um, as quickly and as efficiently as possible, that they did clearly vet all the available options. and. Uh, and uh, arrived on a solution. And one other thing for me. Um, sure. The coincidence or near coincidence in terms of timing of the release of the four and eventually a fifth uh, uh, U.S. Right. Uh, person detained in Iran and this payment um, naturally leads people to wonder if they are causally uh, related. Without using the word ransom, um, why shouldn't people believe that uh, that the two events are somehow linked, and that you would not have gotten the Iran the U.S. citizens out absent the resolution of of, uh, of this matter and the payment of these funds? Sure, um, I mean, it, and honestly, it's a fair question given how these all uh, came to a head at the same time. And I think we've addressed that, and in in, at the time we addressed it, obviously. Um, and, you know, what I think is that you saw, the, these, are, these were three very separate efforts. And in fact, with regard to the tribunal and the settlement of those claims, I mean, that tribunal was established in 1981. Some of these claims had been, uh, had been in process or in train for, uh, the settlement of them for many, many years, decades, in fact. Um, I think what one can fairly say is that, uh, and I think we acknowledge this at the time, is that our negotiations to reach the nuclear deal with Iran did open up enough space, if you will, for us to uh, reach a resolution on other outstanding issues. We were very clear all along and, and uh, that there was never a linkage uh, between uh, reaching the JCPOA and freeing the Americans. Um, but we never failed to uh, advocate for the release in every time we met with the Iranians. Uh, and similarly, there was no linkage between the settlement and the freeing of these Americans. But uh, we saw an opportunity to resolve um, these three separate pieces concurrently that were being resolved at the same time. And of course, you know, that was to what we believed our national security interests and uh, our advantage. Um, and in the case of the settlement, we've made the case, uh, President on down has made the case that uh, because of this settlement, because it wasn't, it didn't, wasn't decided by the tribunal, we believe we saved uh, American taxpayers Lots of money. And by no linkage, is it fair? I got two more sure, quick sure. ones, sorry. Right, yeah, no, Just by, by no linkage, yeah. that you mean no quid pro quo. Exactly. Thank okay. You. And then second, um, do you understand why the Iranians may themselves see a quid pro quo here? Yeah, you know, and I, it's hard for me to speak to that. And I saw the, the quote in the article um, by an Iranian commander. Um, I mean, we've said before, you know, we we see things in the Iranian press all the time by senior Iranian officials. Um, we try not to respond to them, frankly, because they're largely meant for uh, domestic consumption. Uh, it, you know, they have their political sphere, as we do, or their political environment. Uh, it's just, again, I, you know, uh, I, I would just say there was no quid pro quo, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know for what reason uh, they would be saying there was. Please. All politics aside, 
Yes, I'm a little bit confused on a couple of things regarding this issue. One, these are Iranian money that were unfrozen because that's right legally unfrozen, correct? Yep. Okay. Yeah, this so, was money. Second, that, yeah, go ahead. Right, I'm sorry. Okay. Second, I understand that you're saying that the global financial system was not open to the Iranian, but uh, explain to me why couldn't this be done like a, a straightforward financial transaction through a third party? I mean, directly with the, to one, through one of your allies and so on. I mean, this gets done every day, hundreds of times. No, I mean, it, it, not in terms of cash that no, is carried in bags and so on, but in terms sure. of a, you know, upfront, open, declared kind of a financial sure. transaction. Again, I, I you know, I, I don't want to go down, uh, get too far in the details of how the financial transaction took place. Um, other than to say that, you know, we were operating under certain limitations that all of the various options were looked at and vetted and, uh, you know, we went with an option that uh, succeeded in uh, getting the Iranians the money that they were owed through the settlement. Now, uh, there is still some money, you know, for the Iranians, uh, as you, you said to begin with. Is it likely to happen the same way or is it going to be done differently? I can't speak to that. I mean, we'll, you know, obviously uh, make good on all our commitments uh, that we've reached with them legally through the uh, settlement process, but uh, I can't speak to even what the timeline is for that. Please. Oh, go ahead. Dave, I just want to clarify this, that uh, the executive branch can, you know, go ahead and do what it wants to do to carry out, and in this case, I'm not, I have no questions on that, but have you, does the executive not supposed to uh, inform the legislative, the Congress or Senate about these actions because yes, just, we uh, always inform, less than yeah. I think less than an hour ago, Senator McCain has issued a statement, and in that he says, "I'll quote: It is clear that this payment was a ransom for Americans held hostage in Iran." Uh, quote closed. So, uh, if he was, if he was, you know. Right. If he knew about this, he will not make that statement like that. So how are you going to, you know, if this had not come out in that story, uh, how this would have been a hush-hush thing or it would have, you would have put out a statement saying that we have transferred 400 or yeah. million. And I, I, I can you put I, a statement out in January yes, saying it. Yeah, and I can assure you that, you know, we don't do anything without notifying Congress, uh, regardless of what that may be, um, you know, we always, you know, uh, make uh, Congress aware of whatever actions we're taking. With all due respect from, uh, to, to Senator McCain, I would also uh, object to his uh, comparison that this was, or his allegation that this was some kind of ransom. As I said, it was not. It was not a quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. It was not a ransom. Uh, you, what you saw was the culmination, as I said, of several lines of effort. Uh, in particular, this one that had been ongoing over the course of many years uh, that we saw an opportunity to resolve quickly uh, and to our advantage. Please. Uh, go ahead. Um, One minute, uh, uh, going back to that Matt's question about yep. uh, uh, whether it was more than 10,000 or uh, I, I went through the, the, the government of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, rules about uh, taking out money out of the country. Uh, and uh, so in that there is no exception that government can do this. So is it something, uh, who authorizes it? Is it, uh, you know, how the, this is done? Is, are the, those rules not applicable to the government transactions? Because, or is it the first one? Because we have heard about, uh, you know, sacks of or, uh, suitcases of uh, cash to Afghanistan or other places. So can you just explain, you know, throw some light on what, what exactly goes on, like, well, again, I, I said this before several times, TJ, and I'm not going to speak to, you know, um, the mechanics of uh, how the settlement payment was made. Um, you know, if you have broader questions about how money is exchanged, uh, uh, you know, for these kinds of settlements, I would probably direct you to the uh, Department of Treasury. Please. Go ahead, James. Can you at least assure us that the hostages were in the process of being set free prior to the touching down of this plane with the pallets of cash. Uh, I, I'm, so, and I want to be very precise here. Um, so, uh, 
and I was actually with the secretary uh, in uh, Vienna, I want to say, um, uh, when the, we did reach the, this was the night of the um, uh, implementation uh, of the JCPOA. Um, and as I said, it was a moment where three separate lines of effort were culminating at the same time. Um, and all of them were, as I said, separate but distinct lines of effort operating concurrently. You had the JCPOA Implementation Day. You had the uh, freeing of the American hostages or, hostages or detainees. Then you also had this Hague settlement taking place. So as to the timing, I, I simply don't, I can't answer conclusively that these hostages or these detainees, Americans, were on a plane before that money arrived. I might be able to get you an answer on that. But what I can say, sure. what I can say though, categorically, is that there was not any kind of uh, understanding uh, on the part of the Iranians, and certainly not on the part of us, that these that these two were linked. That one had to happen before the other would. Was this a U.S. military plane that transported this currency? I have to refer you, I apologize for doing that to the Department of Defense to really answer how that was, uh, if that was the case. And again, I, 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 I can't speak to the mechanics of how the... Do you the, happen to know the answer to my question, whether you see fit to address it from this podium? Uh, not with 100% uh, uh, certainty, no. Would you describe uh, this arrangement whereby the United States um, wires a large amount like this to European central banks for the purposes of conversion of the currency and then the stacking of it in this way on pallets <coughs> aboard an unmarked plane for delivery to a foreign government. Is that typically how we do business? No. Um, and again, I don't want to, I'm not going to confirm the allegations that are made in this article. What I will say is that um, when we're, we're forced to get a little creative, let me put it this way, when we're dealing with a country that was largely cut off from international financial institutions and the international banking system due to years of sanctions. Uh, and so operating in that environment, we had to look at available options to us in order to get that money to them. Money that, frankly, was their money, plus interest. And one other um, um, development that, that appears to have taken place roughly around the same time was the capture and release of the U.S. Navy sailors by Iran, which is just a few days before the arrival of this unmarked cargo plane. Um, and so uh, can you assure us that no ransom was paid for absolutely those hostages? Absolutely no linkage on that. Absolutely no linkage at all. I can absolutely 100 percent confirm that there was no linkage in that regard. In fact, I thought that was, and I forgive me if I'm, my timing is, sense of timing is wrong, but I thought that was several weeks uh, after uh, the fact. Uh, but. But no, no quid pro quo, no ransom, nothing to do with the, uh, uh, the freed American sailors. Thank you. Yep. The idea of the, I, this is a question about the actual yeah. deal okay. itself. Uh, it's a question that I asked earlier this week and yeah. uh, yesterday. You have seen the, um, the report from David Albright's ISIS, the good ISIS, on uh, breakout times after year, um, after year 13. Yes, this is this involves the also the AP story that was from right. last month. The ISIS, the, the their estimate is that the breakout time after year thirteen doesn't go down by six months as we had calculated it, but goes down to four months, even less. What this is you, after year ten. Thirteen. Thirteen, rather. Okay, sorry. Um, I asked Kirby about this history. He hadn't said he hadn't seen it. So I'm just yeah, and I apologize, Matt. I, I don't have it in front of me. I, I think we would stand by uh, what we said previously. Um, we've had this, uh, you know, we've had all of our experts and uh, look at this, and, and we would stand by what we've said, which is six months. Um, if that changes a hundred. Which is so six that months. No, that's what we estimated it to be. You're talking about the report. The, 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 the they say the, that, well, the, yeah. the AP report, calculated it at six months breakout after year 13. ISIS says if it's not six months, know, it's yeah. four months. It's actually less. The breakout time would be less after year 13. All I can say, we, we haven't changed our assessment. I'm going to put it that way. Well, listen, back in April of last year, before the final deal was done, yep. uh, but after the interim agreement was agreed, uh, President Obama did an interview with NPR. This is on April 7th. 
and he was asked about concerns about the deal, in, especially in the in the out years of it. And he said, "What is more, what is a more relevant fear would be that in year 13, 14, 15, they have advanced centrifuges that enrich uranium fairly rapidly, <clears throat> and at that point, the breakout time would have shrunk to almost, almost down to zero." Now, that would seem that the administration, four months is not zero, but it would seem that the administration had this same concern. Does it not? Has that concern well, I, faded? I mean, not, not at all, Matt. And I think we've, you know, when we were addressing the initial uh, leak of the report and the AP story uh, that did so, I think we were very clear in saying that what we believe the JCPOA has allowed us is to have eyes on Iran's nuclear program so that if after year 15 uh, we see a concerted effort for them to uh, attain a nuclear weapon, we will be able to detect that okay, with enough time. You're 13, not 15. That's just one. Sorry. But, but anyway, the same day that that, that, that interview aired on NPR, your, one of your predecessors was asked about this comment and whether or not, well, asked about, it was unusual because the president was trying to sell the deal as something good, and yet here it was saying he was saying, or appeared to be saying that the breakout time would shrink, um, would shrink, almost down to zero. He said we're now talking four months according to independent experts, and what your predecessor said was that the quote was garbled and it was not, it was a little confusing, but that. The president was referring to a scenario in which there was no deal at all, not to a scenario in which you had reached a final deal. And that yeah. just seems to be now flat out wrong. So I'm wondering if you can explain that. I, I can't. I don't have the president's transcript in front of me. I don't right have here. the. So I'll show it to you afterwards. Why, why don't we do this? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to try to get you answers to your questions. I would just say that, you know, in general, we understand that the breakout time will be diminished after specific years. We're aware of that, but uh, part of the JCPOA is to provide us with the access, uh, the eyes on Iran's nuclear program, civilian now nuclear program, so that we're able to detect any shift uh, whatsoever towards the uh, a possible attainment of a nuclear weapon and address it okay, accordingly. So then just to put a very fine point on it, yep. and I'll stop then. Yeah. You, the administration concedes that the year-long minimum breakout that you had sought breakout time that you had sought in the negotiations essentially disappears after year 13, not after year 15. I don't want to confirm that. I want to look at uh, what, what uh, sorry. Sure, Before we oh, do, wait, I I'm just sorry. wanted to uh, Please, express my gratitude that you agreed earlier to uh, accept as a taken question the matter of whether or not this plane carrying all this cash touched down before or after the process had begun to release these detainees. What I will say to you, James, is that um, whatever transfer of funds took place uh, to the Iranians, I can try to uh, see what the timeline was. Uh, but again, making very clear that there was no quid pro quo, there was no uh, tit for tat uh, involved. Is open. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Why don't I go back? I'll get to you side. I'm going to go to the Okay, back. so <laughs> the Russian Ministry of Defense reports that in Aleppo there was recently a, a chemical I'm weapons attack. I'll, let's finish. I promise okay. we'll get to you. I just want right. to... So just really quickly, yeah. um, CNN, uh, it, it, yeah. was there any concern in this building about the optics? I mean, I know you're saying there's no quid pro quo, but when you're doing it on the same day and that much cash, I mean, was there not that both in Iran or and just internationally this would be seen as potentially linked? I mean, was I, that It's a concern? fair question, and of course, yes. I mean, look, we, we were aware that this was the – of the optics. Um, uh, however, um, one of the reasons we try uh, to address it uh, up front, and as I said, the President spoke to this uh, settlement, uh, Secretary Kerry spoke to this settlement uh, at the time and tried to say, look, guys, I know it looks like, but there's no there there. Um, and so we've always been aware of it, but that didn't keep us from, frankly, sealing a deal that saved the American taxpayers a considerable sum of money. And then just on the fact that it was cash, I don't want to go too much into the mechanics, was there any also concern that bulk cash like that could be used uh, by Iran to fund some of its more, you know, nefarious, nefarious activities? activities? I mean, just I mean, what we've seen, and uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think it was Brennan who spoke about this uh, a week or so ago, what we've seen thus far, uh, and that's not saying that there's any guarantees to any of this, but so far what they've used the, 
the, the, the settlement for has not been for any nefarious activities. In fact, it's been uh, uh, directed towards uh, <coughs> development projects, infrastructure projects. Now, I say that with no guarantees, but that's what we've seen so far. Please. Uh, just one more thing. It'll be very brief. Okay. I just wanted to know, did, you, did, you, did the Iranians agree or demand that this, whatever form of payment it was, or did they agree on a specific form? Or did they know. demand a specific form? I don't know. I mean, did you guys offer them, how about 400 million in diamonds? And they said, no, 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 we want cash. Or can you give us, did they have to agree? I, I to honestly the don't know the answer to that. But I'm, I can go back to the diamonds and gold, like, so that's some easier currency. <laughs> well, it's outside the international financial so. system, which seems so. to be your biggest concern here. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I don't have the answer for you. If I can get an answer, I'll let you know. Please. Um, the Russian Ministry of Defense says that in Aleppo there was recently a chemical weapons attack and that it was conducted by the Harakat Nur al Zenki organization, which is an opposition group that has received support from the United States. Um, is the United States still supporting this organization? Uh, so unaware of that allegation, the only thing I'm aware of is the alleged chemical uh, weapons attack uh, on the town of Sarakem. Uh, I don't. I think we're talking about separate incidents. If I'm, if I'm correct, I don't know. I'm referring uh, this, to something in Aleppo. This was. You're talking about something in Aleppo. So, haven't seen those reports. Obviously, as we said with the uh, uh, incident that took place, I think uh, two days ago, allegedly, uh, there were reports of chemical weapons being used in a, another town. But it, the same would hold true with this. Is, uh, you know, obviously, uh, we condemn strongly uh, the use of any chemical weapons and any credible allegations of their use. Uh, in Syria uh, will investigate. And I believe it's the purview of the OPC, uh, OPCW uh, that, would, um, that, that would carry out such an investigation. As to your follow-on question about this group, um, I don't have in front of me that we actually fund them. I mean, we, uh, you're saying we, we provide them with assistance? Yes, as part of the, the so-called moderate opposition. Yeah. I, I don't know what now the group again, also I, don't, I don't haven't seen the allegations yet, so I think it's too early for me to a make that assessment and b make that connection. Well, it's been said that that the State Department is also investigating allegations. I mean, there's a video of this group beheading a ten year old Palestinian yes. boy. Yeah, um, how are those investigations going? Has there been any result? Um, uh, yeah, so we did talk about that. We were looking into those uh, that incident. Uh, obviously, we condemned uh, if it were true. I know that the group itself said that they had also uh, made some arrests and then set up a commission of inquiry into the, uh, into the um, incident. I don't have any updates at this point in time, but I can certainly check and get back to you. So what does a rebel group in Syria have to do to not receive U.S. funds any longer? What is, what is the line that they must cross? What kind of controversial incident must take place for a group to stop receiving U.S. funds? Well, first of all, um, there's a, a lot of vetting of the Syrian moderate opposition uh, that has already taken place. And it's not just by the U.S., but it's by uh, all the members of the ISSG and, frankly, the U.N. Uh, and it was established that uh, al-Nusra, as well as uh, Daesh or ISIL, were considered to be, by all members and by the U.N., to be uh, terrorist organizations. Um, I, I think, again, these are not easy processes, um, and uh, one incident here and there would not necessarily make you a terrorist group. Now, let me be, let me. Uh, be very clear that we don't condone any of the activities that you just cited, uh, possible use of chemical weapons, possible beheading of a young child, any human rights abuses, any of those things would give us serious cause for concern. Uh, that said, uh, where we are in the broader geopolitical or political situation in, uh, in Syria is, uh, and one of the, uh, the ongoing discussions that we've been having with Russia is how do we clearly delineate between these known terrorist groups, Nusra and Daesh, and the moderate opposition. And how do we have a clear understanding of who is where so that we can, longer game here, get back in place a, a cessation of hostilities that is credible, that can also then jumpstart the political process. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is that even if these allegations are true, there's still a chance that the United States would continue supporting these groups. Is that what you're saying? I'm not making any, uh, I'm not frankly answering any hypotheticals. We just don't know at this point. Uh, as I said, uh, we would regard any of the acts that you mentioned uh, or cited, uh, and again, they are just allegations at this point. We take them very seriously and look into them They're and investigate them. They're not a red line Again, and, and I, U.S. support. I, uh, so for a terrorist organization, there are fundamental uh, actions, one of which is an intention to carry out terrorist attacks, uh, both within Syria but as well as on the West. 
Um, you know, some of these groups, uh, as I said, Nusra and Al Qaeda, have, or well, Al Qaeda is not Al Nusra. Uh, they're one and the same. And Daesh uh, have expressed and indeed acted on uh, these intentions. But as to the other members of the moderate Syrian opposition, look, we're un constantly evaluating their behavior. And frankly, for them to be a member of the moderate Syrian opposition and to be part of uh, the cessation of hostilities and the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, it requires that they meet the standards. And those standards are respect for human rights and adherence to a cessation of hostilities. And does that include not using chemical weapons? Is that part of the standard? Of course. So you, you're, the, you're, you're still looking into the chemical weapons charges? Yes. Yeah, I don't have any updates forth. on that. So, yeah. Just to be clear, if a group was using chemical weapons, their funding would be cut off? Again, I, 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 I will not make any uh, statements of one or the other until we know all the facts and have determined who was to blame for any. I mean, honestly, that's the first time I'm hearing about a report for use of chemical weapons. But again, we have also seen reports of the use of chemical weapons uh, on, a, on another town, uh, and we're looking into that. So, I mean, again, we just don't have, have a policy not to support groups that use chemical weapons. We condemn the use of chemical y weapons. Yes, but do you have a policy of not supporting groups that do such things? Again, we would evaluate any support for any groups that are, are engaged in any kind of activity that, frankly, go against international norms. The other thing, the other thing, you, said about, the other thing you said was the possible beheading. Are, are you not convinced that the, the video is No, I'm not. Is I, 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 I'm just not aware that we've determined who exactly who is, behind who is actually it. behind it. Thank you. Yes, um, t today marks the second anniversary of the beginning of ISIS genocide against the Yazidis, yep. you know, including wholesale mur murder and institutionalized rape and sexual slavery of Yazidi women. And the Yazidis and the Kurdistan regional government, because of the, uh, you know, the, the nature of these crimes, crimes against humanity, are trying to get these crimes referred to the International Criminal Court but they are not getting support from the United States or not enough support from the United States for this referral. And why doesn't the U.S. do more to help uh, the Yazidis and the Kurdistan regional government get these crimes referred to the ICC? Sure. Um, so a couple of points to make. One is, you know, there's no doubt, uh, obviously, uh, that those responsible for uh, the heinous acts that have been carried out against the Yazidi people uh, should be held accountable for their actions. Um, and there are certainly venues at national and international uh, levels in which account accountability could be pursued, uh, and that includes the International Criminal Court uh, in appropriate circumstances. Uh, I think I would just say that our focus, immediate focus, uh, is on supporting the efforts of the Iraqi uh, security forces and authorities uh, to hold the perpetrators of Daesh's uh, atrocities accountable. And in both Iraq and Syria, um, we are supporting ongoing efforts to document and to analyze and preserve evidence of the atrocities that have been committed there uh, that could serve a, a wide range of future uh, uh, justice purposes, accountability purposes. Uh, so I'm not going to say that we want them to pursue this at the International Criminal Court. I would just say, as we've said in the past, it's often for uh, these countries, these nations, uh, and these people uh, to decide for themselves how they want uh, uh, accountability to be held. Uh, I think our goal here is to see that there is accountability, and that's something we always would encourage. These are crimes against humanity, and trying them in a national judicial system like Iraq doesn't seem sufficient, plus which a large number of these crimes took place in another country like Syria. And they're asking for the United States to support their efforts to try them in some international forum. And, and we have not excluded that. Um, you know, I think there's, as I said, there's a number of venues uh, at which uh, accountability can be pursued, and that includes the International Criminal Court. Um, I think at this point in the state, we're still, uh, frankly, in the process of uh, trying to work with the Iraqi security forces to destroy, degrade, uh, dash uh, on the ground. I mean, it still holds territory in Iraq. We've made tremendous progress, but our focus is still on defeating Daesh on the battlefield. Um, but as we do that, uh, we're certainly working with um, Iraqi authorities uh, to collect evidence, as I said, to preserve evidence that can be used in whatever 
process of accountability that eventually takes place. Do Yazidis feel that the Iraqi government does not pay attention to their problems? Uh, again, I, I'm, I, you know, we're obviously acutely aware uh, of the Yazidi suffering. Uh, we've been a huge advocate for them, including uh, the uh, gestures that or the airstrikes that took place uh, to save a large portion of them. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, many of them were uh, systematically killed and wiped out by Daesh, by ISIL. Um, uh, and as I said, we're committed to helping them and helping Iraqi authorities uh, find justice. Can I change topics? Of course. Can I go to the Palestinian Israeli issue? Of course. Uh, last Wednesday, the, the, the department issued a very strong statement that was really, you know, kind of uh, encompassed the uh, um, uh, protesting, home demolition, expansion of settlement, you know, the maltreatment of Palestinians, I mean, the whole, the whole gamut and so on. But ever since then, the Israelis have done many, many things, including demolishing more homes, demolishing more agricultural outposts, uh, uh, re you know, enforcing administrative uh, arrest uh, law and imprisonment law against children and so on. It seems that every time, you know, every time that you say something or issue a statement, expressing displeasure, the Israelis, you know, they double down on what they're doing. And, uh, you know, and, and this is really happening on the eve of, uh, you know, maybe concluding the largest uh, deal in history in terms of arms. You know, we're talking about $40 billion over 10 years. So why or uh, what will the United States do to make good on its, you know, expression of displeasure? Well, um, you know, uh, I want to go through all the I things understand that they have done. And Look, um, you know, uh, we don't hesitate uh, to uh, speak to our concerns about uh, Israel's behavior when we believe it uh, uh, is counterproductive to what our, uh, our goal and, frankly, the stated goal of Israel and the Palestinian people uh, is, which is a two-state solution. Uh, so we're uh, we're forthright and we're uh, transparent about our concerns when they arise. And certainly, uh, you know, that speaks to ongoing settlement activity. And that was, as you noted, the statement that came out, I think, on July 27th. Um, uh, and we're going to continue to uh, make those concerns clear uh, to the Israeli authorities uh, as appropriate, uh, both, you know, uh, in our diplomatic engagement with them, which is nearly constant, uh, daily, at all levels, but also publicly where we see fit. Um, you know, speaking to the broader relationship, though, we have an ironclad commitment to Israel's security. Uh, and our MOU, as you alluded to, uh, is evidence of that. Uh, and, you know, it's – look, I mean, our relationship with, with Israel is uh, – is vast, but very strong. We believe they are uh, a strong democratic force in the region. Um, we understand uh, the need they have to protect their citizens against uh, terrorism and violence. But in all cases, uh, we always ask that they act with restraint and with respect for the human rights of uh, the Palestinian people. I understand, but I'm saying that the United States, you know, has a great deal of leverage, basically, to say, listen, you've got to stop doing this. I mean, not only say we disapprove, we condemn, and so on, but, you, you know, you've got to stop doing it, you know, because a lot of this money goes directly to aid the settlement, to expanding the settlements, and do other things. Well, look, I mean, uh, you know, all I can say to that is, you know, um, in diplomacy and in uh, bilateral and, frankly, multilateral relationships, you know, you need to have multiple channels and multi multiple levels of engagement. And you've got to be able to say, we disagree here, but we're going to continue to provide for your security as much as possible because we value your friendship and your alliance uh, in a region where it is valuable. And okay. in our national interest. Okay. I'm just My, saying, like, you got to compartmentalize. And I, I'm not trying to trivialize one or the other. Sorry. I've got a related question. Are, are you aware of this uh, incident in which apparently some um, 
five Americans were detained and then expelled by Israel uh, at, yes. at the airport. Do you know anything about that? So, yeah, Have you thanks. said um, anything to the Israelis about it, or is it some, some, something that you regard as their right, just as any other country's right, to allow or deny entry? So, um, first of all, we are aware of these reports. Uh, it was a group of citizens that were denied entry into Israel and deported. Um, you know, uh, it answered your question. I can't speak specifically due to privacy considerations. Um, I, I know that's a uh, sensitive topic for you, but we're unable to comment on these uh, specific cases. But generally speaking, uh, you know, the U.S. government seeks equal treatment uh, and freedom for, to travel for all U.S. citizens, regardless of national origin or ethnicity. And specifically, uh, the U.S. government remains concerned about uh, unequal treatment uh, that Arab Americans, some Arab Americans, receive at Israel's borders and checkpoints. And we regularly raise with uh, Israeli authorities uh, our concerns about uh, the issue of equal treatment for all U.S. citizens at ports of entry. And I'm sure, without speaking to this specific case, that, you know, that we'll do, this, we'll do the same. So you, you believe, without getting into the <laughs> details of this, you believe that this is a, a case of unequal treatment? Uh, we have. Uh, you said you're sure yeah. that, that, that you'll raise these concerns again, which suggests that you do believe that this is a case of unequal treatment. Is that correct, or am I being too? No, no, no. That's okay. Um, uh, it's a fair question. I, I would just say that we're we have seen uh, cases of this in the past. We'll look into this incident. Uh, if it is indeed a case, we'll raise it. Time and again. I know. Time and again. Because I, I, I apologize. Let me just for this. Very, very quickly ask questions. you on one, one last we'll thing. One last, yep. thing. Yep. Just, I promise. One, one last thing. One last thing. Did the secretary agree when he met with Abbas to support the the French initiative? Um, I don't believe any decision was made categorically to. You know, I, I know that we've had ongoing discussions, and in fact, he met with Elro when he was there in Paris, uh, and uh, we have. Uh, been in continual contact with the French, but we've not made any specific uh, decisions on whether to support it. Please. Uh, just then I'll get back to your comments. question on the Japanese cabinet reshuffling. Uh, do you have any comments, particularly on the defense minister? Uh, she's been, been seen as very conservative. Both China and Korea have made uh, complaints. No, I mean, look, uh, we're aware, obviously, of the uh, uh, new Japanese cabinet. Um, uh, from our perspective, we're going to maintain, sustain, and frankly, work to deepen uh, our close cooperation with the government of Japan, and that's across a range of regional and global issues. Um, and we want to, obviously, as I said, strengthen our cooperative efforts. Um, it's specific to your question about the uh, defense minister. Um, I, I don't want to get into commenting on the, what we consider to be really domestic politics in Japan. Well, in the past, she's made regular visits to Yasukuni Shrine, and um, when asked earlier today, she did not, she did not rule out a visit uh, or later this month. Um, sure. And visiting, is visiting the shrine something you would, you would discourage, given that you have spoken about Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I just say we continue to emphasize the importance of uh, approaching uh, historical legacy issues with a man, in a manner, rather, that promotes uh, healing and reconciliation, and that's always been our position regarding the shrine. I'll get in the back, and then if I have time. Thank you. Uh, yep. okay. Thank you. Oh, oh my God, Sorry. so confused. On North Korea, and as you know that uh, yep. North Korea launched uh, two uh, ballistic missiles to, to uh, see of Japan yesterday. Do you have any comment on this? Uh, any comments? Yeah, we're aware of the reports, obviously. We're monitoring and continue to assess the situation. Uh, with, in close coordination with our regional allies and partners. Uh, we strongly condemn uh, this uh, action as well as uh, North Korea's other recent missile tests, uh, which uh, goes without saying violate multiple UN Security Council resolutions uh, explicitly prohibiting North Korea from uh, using ballistic missile technology. Um, you know, we intend to raise our concerns at, at the UN uh, to bolster international resolve and commitment to uh, hold DPRK accountable for uh, these provocative actions. Um, I don't want to speak to the outcome of any meetings, but I think their, the Security Council consultations uh, will uh, take place sometime this afternoon uh, to address uh, last night's launch. 
But the, regarding when the North Korean uh, continued launch the ballistic, ballistic missiles or Lodon missiles, does the U.S. have any strong uh, that another sanctions uh, against uh, North Korea? Does you have any plans? Sure. Well, I mean, look, uh, you know, I never want to preclude any additional sanctions, but we did pass a very strong sanctions package uh, several months ago. Sorry, I can't remember the exact date. Um, you know, and as we always say, that with sanctions, they're only as effective as, as well as they're implemented. And so what our focus has been is working with uh, other like-minded partners in the region, certainly that includes China, in trying to uh, ensure that uh, these sanctions are implemented to the uh, full extent uh, possible uh, so that the uh, DPRK, the North Korean regime, uh, feels the squeeze and is encouraged uh, to then engage with the international community and address their concerns about its nuclear program. Because I have to end there. I'm sorry. sorry, there's too much going on here. One, South Sudan. Okay. Well, I mean, okay. schedule the briefing so you have enough time to answer the questions around the world. Don't, don't just like trying to run away after. I, I'm sorry. Has anyone seen me South, run away from, no, uh, from exactly. this podium? Well, I that's, think I've been up here. Fair, fair enough. You have been. Okay. South Sudan, right? The place is on the brink of collapse. <laughs> Um, not so long ago, this was being hailed as, you know, kind of a, a triumph for uh, U.S. and other, other uh, diplomacy. I'm just wondering if you have any specific concerns about the situation there today. Uh, we do. Um, See? You wanted to say this. <laughs> um, you wanted to have the time to say yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're obviously very concerned about the current violence. Um, uh, we're calling on all sides to abide by the ceasefire and refrain from any more destabilizing rhetoric. Um, we're doing everything we can to press actors on both sides to end the current violence. Uh, we've also uh, called for an immediate halt to combat operations and full compliance with the peace agreement that was signed a year ago. Um, uh, you know, I think that I would say that the United States is deeply disappointed uh, in the leadership of South Sudan, uh, that given the opportunity of independence and then, frankly, a second chance uh, that came with the August 2015 uh, peace agreement, have thus far failed to put aside personal power struggles for the good of their people. Um, you know, but we are working still uh, to address uh, the crisis. And that certainly includes, uh, you know, almost $1.6 billion now in uh, emergency humanitarian assistance. That dates back to 2013, but certainly that's something we continue to, uh, uh, to, um, to address. Um, and we work with, uh, you know, our like-minded regional partners uh, to address uh, the crisis. But, uh, you know, obviously it's a tremendous concern. And, uh, you know, the killing continues. Uh, um, and uh, the disregard for the peace agreement continues. All right. Two very please. extremely brief ones yeah, please, please. having to do with congressional letters. One on yeah. Haiti. Yeah. Are you aware of a letter that was sent by numerous uh, members of the House uh, asking for the Secretary to push or press the UN harder on dealing with the cholera ec epidemic in Haiti? And if you are familiar with it, are you aware of any response? And is the Secretary willing or able to do that? So uh, you're talking about, uh, yes, a congressional letter on color, color, excuse me, I apologize. Um, I've been up here so long, my voice is <laughs> waning. Um, uh, no, certainly we appreciate, uh, I think it was Representative Conyers' uh, leadership uh, on this issue. We're going to continue to work with him and the United Nations. Uh, we did receive his letter, uh, as you noted, of June 29th. We we're going to respond. Uh, we do plan to express in the letter uh, our agreement that the devastation and human suffering caused by the cholera outbreak is tragic and to underscore our commitment, uh, first and foremost, to a robust and sustained response to the epidemic itself, uh, one that is designed to leave Haitian communities stronger, healthier, and more resilient uh, in the future. Uh, so we have thus far provided more than $95 million uh, for cholera treatment and prevention efforts in Haiti. Uh, this assistance is complemented by substantial U.S. assistance package for Haiti's overall health system. And we obviously continue to work intensively with the U.N. to support and amplify its efforts in Haiti to contain the disease. 
Uh, there have been significant gains in cholera prevention and control since the peak of the outbreak in 2011. Uh, but there's more work, obviously, to be done. All right, last one on yep. Brazil. Um, but a number of uh, lawmakers have also written to the Secretary, uh, considering he's going to be in Brazil, albeit for the Olympics um, later this week. Um, they, these lawmakers are asking him to express uh, concerns or to push the Brazilian uh, authorities on democracy and rule of law issues while he's there. Do you know if he has any plans to do that? So first of all, let me just, as you noted in your preamble to your question, uh, congratulate and wish Brazil a very successful uh, and safe uh, Olympics. Uh, very excited about the games, although I'm more of a track and field guy. I'll wait for the second week. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, we have received the letter. Uh, we will respond, uh, obviously, as we do to any uh, congressional correspondence. Uh, look, we continue to follow uh, political developments in Brazil. Uh, as we've said, we are confident that Brazil can work through the current uh, political challenges. Uh, and by working within its constitutional framework. But as you know, Secretary is going to be in Rio tomorrow, and he will meet uh, with the Foreign Minister, Jose Serra. And, uh, you know, we can expect that uh, they'll discuss the full range of issues, including, uh, you know, uh, some of these domestic political issues as well. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Russell. Russell. Yeah. You can take it. Oh. Uh, during uh, Indian Prime Minister's uh, visit in, uh, in June, it was uh, with big fanfare announced that U.S. is returning 200 cultural artifacts, uh, estimated at around 100 million uh, at a ceremony. But um, the Indian cultural minister, Mahesh Sharma, in a written reply to the upper house of the Indian parliament said, U.S. authorities have returned only eight antiques to so uh, can you explain yeah, what is I, going on? I, I, I can't. Can you I don't take have the any Can you take the question? I assure you, we'll take, we'll take the question. We'll get you an answer. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. What are the